To understand the workflow and challenges faced by Brady's team, we'll step into the shoes of a user within its organization. The individual is responsible for selecting which security contexts, or SCs, the application scheduled to deploy will need to request in order to satisfy the pod and the container requirements for that application. In later modules within this course, you'll assume the role of a cluster administrator like Brady, who will craft rules around what permissions can be requested across which parts of the cluster and to whom those permissions are accessible or not. As you'll see, setting security context constraints or SCCs across a cluster is a two-part agreement between the administrator and the users and their applications. So what are security contexts or SCs and security context constraints, SCCs? Both are required for a container or for a pod. The two terms are generally used interchangeably by Red Hatters and IBMers to configure across protected Linux operating systems functions and permissions on something like an OpenShift container platform cluster. The SCs and SCCs are an essential tool in securing access to the cluster and ensuring that compromised containers or applications possess as little risk as possible to the rest of the system. In other words, granting only the minimal amount of permissions required to jobs running on the system in the cluster and minimizing the risk of contagion should things go awry or something like a container be hijacked by a malicious actor. SCs are defined by an application programmer or developer, and they serve as the inventory of all the permissions and access to protected Linux functions and application will require in order to perform its duties on the cluster. The SCs are defined within the pod or the container, and they will attempt to deploy the containerized application code into production. The important thing to remember is that the SCs inventory is considered by OpenShift to be a request not a mandate, and it's not set in stone. OpenShift and the Linux operating system now at its core, CoreOS as it so happens to be named, has the leverage to accept or reject the permissions that were requested as part of that pod, its SCs, and the deployment manifest. The evaluation criteria for whether these requests are accepted or not are detailed in the security context constraints, or SCCs, that are defined by the cluster administrator, someone like Brady. Unless a permission is otherwise given and explicitly stated in the SCC, a request made by the SC will be rejected and the pod will fail to launch. By default, all new pods or containers are deployments that are assigned an SCC labeled as restricted, which will block access to all protected Linux functions. Unless additional SCs are requested by the developer as part of the pod's deployment manifest, the pod and its applications will inherit the restricted SCC permissions. To gain higher levels of permissions and functions, the developer needs to craft their own custom SC, and the administrator will have to agree making available SCCs that meet the specifications and levels of permissions. SCCs are enforced within the OpenShift container platform using SC Linux and AppArmor, which are two security modules included at the kernel of multiple Red Hat offerings, which include everything from RHEL, Red Hat CoreOS, and others. Nodes in an OpenShift container platform from versions 4 and up are only permitted to run RHEL or Red Hat CoreOS as the kernel operating system, and therefore it's guaranteed that SCCs and SCs and the enforcement of the two is part of every OpenShift cluster out of the box from day one. Now, this may sound complicated, and we've thrown out a lot of terms so far. Don't worry, we'll spend plenty of time explaining the terminology and giving context as to why these permissions matter, as well as give you the hands-on lessons using your cluster to practice these concepts yourself. To kick things off, let's create a simple containerized application that is able to write to the Linux file system of your OpenShift environment. We'll keep things as bare bones as possible by limiting the interactions to a terminal SSH window only, so there's no need to go about creating a web or a graphical interface. By design, the container will be used to mount an empty directory volume in lieu of a real file system. This will allow our sample application to perform Linux commands on an ephemeral empty directory volume to test privileges and access controls without compromising security on the OpenShift cluster itself. Our first step will be to open a terminal or PuTTY window, which we'll be using to submit OC command line interface instructions to the Red Hat OpenShift console. 
Try executing the following instruction to see if OC is already installed on your system by entering OC two dashes version. If the command fails or returns a message that OC could not be found, you'll need to spend a moment installing the necessary drivers before you proceed. Return to the OpenShift web dashboard from your OpenShift cluster and click the question mark icon near the top right of the page as shown in your documentation. There'll be a drop down that appears and from that I want you to select the command line tools button. You'll be presented with a list of binaries for the OC command line interface. Download the binary that matches the operating system of your current machine and the architecture of that device. Once downloaded, double click on the downloaded binaries to begin installation of the OC CLI. If you're running on a Mac OS device, you may receive an error message similar to what's documented on the lab instruction set. If you do see that error, you'll need to manually allow the image to run on your machine. You can do so by clicking the Apple icon in the top left corner of your desktop and then drilling down into System Preferences, Security and Privacy, and then the General tab from the top items of that screen. A message towards the bottom of the panel will say that OSU is blocked from use, which we will then bypass by clicking the Open Anyway button to the right of the message. Confirm your decision and then try double-clicking the binary file again in your Downloads folder. Complete the installation process as you did before, and then restart by exiting and reopening your terminal window. Test again the OC dash dash version to see that OC is now completely up and running on your system. And I also want to note that some users have encountered errors with installing OCCLI through the OpenShift supplied binaries. If you're still unable at this point to access OCCLI after completing the previous steps, an alternative is to install Homebrew for which a link is provided in your documentation, and then in your terminal window, execute the following command to install brew and the OpenShift CLI as a second instruction set. Return to the OpenShift web console dashboard and click the CEC button near the current logged in account as shown in your documentation to open another drop down menu. Click the copy login command button you will then be asked to re-authenticate using HT password, which is the username, CEC user, and the password that you originally used to log into the cluster. A mostly white page will then be loaded. Click the display token button in the top left. Copy the string located below the login with this token headline. Paste the string into your terminal window to remotely connect to the OpenShift cluster over CLI. Note that you need to use the one uniquely generated to your environment. If you're trying to log in with the screenshots in your documentation, that environment is no longer running and it will not work. So go back into your web dashboard and follow the steps as I've outlined here to access your unique login string. Once you've successfully logged in and authenticated to the cluster, you are ready to begin issuing instructions on behalf of Brady and the CSO office. Note that the default project space has automatically been selected and you'll have the opportunity to change this at a later point in this lab. Returning back to our instruction set for Module C on hands-on with SCCs, we'll begin by copy and pasting the YAML or yet another markup language file that is either copied directly from your documentation, so using the PDF or the PowerPoint, or downloaded from a public GitHub repository, which is also linked to you from the documentation. The YAML file represents a deployment manifest of the containerized application that will be launching using OpenShift. To get things rolling for Brady and the team, we won't dissect the details of the YAML definition just yet. That's coming shortly in the following module, where you'll craft and customize your own YAML file. For now, paste the manifest into a text editor on your local machine. I recommend using either Sublime, Atom, or Notepad++, and save that file as the file name deploydefault.yaml to your desktop. Note that the YAML files are very sensitive to white space and spacing in general. The number of tabs or white spaces placed in front of new lines determines the nesting in the hierarchy of the manifest definitions. Be sure to exactly match the white spacing patterning found in the documentation or on the GitHub repo, including the empty final line on line 25. Otherwise, the YAML file may produce errors when you try to deploy the application. With the YAML file saved to your desktop, issue the following instructions to your terminal window. The first instruction will move the pointer to your desktop, or otherwise you can select the directory if you saved your YAML file somewhere else. And the second instruction set will kick off the process of creating the deployment on the OpenShift cluster.
Once that has been submitted, you'll find that almost immediately the deployment manifest should be made available in the OpenShift cluster under your default project collection. We can inspect further details on the deployment within the OpenShift web dashboard itself by examining the YAML description for the pod housing the application. However, before we do that, a few bits of preamble. What we're interested in is what additional annotations were made to the YAML file, the delta between what we submitted to the cluster versus what the YAML file looks like after deployment to the cluster, as that will give us some clues in terms of how permissions and authorizations take place seamlessly, but with deliberate effect within OpenShift. We'll want to take note of which SCC was applied to the manifest, what the container's SC settings are, and what the pod's SC settings look like. The manifest you submitted earlier explicitly specifies that it wants to make use of the default service account, which wasn't strictly necessary for us to include, as that is considered to be the default behavior, unless otherwise specified. But it's worth taking note of the SCC and SC implications of using that service account type. A service account allows an object or a component running in the OpenShift cluster to directly access that cluster's API, essentially playing the role of a broker. The service account is similar to the user account, but its scope is limited to only a single project, rather than across every project a user account might be the owner of. Without further delay, let's again return to the web dashboard of our OpenShift cluster to continue the hands-on experience. Using the perspective switcher in the top left corner of your page, toggle over to the developer perspective. From the taskbar along the left side of the page, navigate to the topology screen. Here you can see a new tile displayed for the running SCC tutorial deploy default application, which is what our YAML file that we submitted earlier defined for us. Click the center of that application tile by clicking into the middle of that circle to pull open a panel that reveals more details on the deployed application. Next, use the perspective switch once again and toggle back to the administrator view. Navigate by drilling down into workloads and then deployments and take note of the same application from the list. The second column from the left denotes the status field. Click the one of one pods value to open up more details on the pod that supports that application. A new page will load displaying a list of the pods that are running the containerized application. In this case, it's only a single pod. Click the name of that pod, the first column from the left of the table, in this case something close to SCC tutorial deploy default, followed by some string. And that will allow you to further inspect the details on that particular pod. At last we can dig into the details of the YAML file and observe what new annotations were made to the original manifest definition that we prefaced earlier. From the tabs along the top of the page, click the YAML button. Note that the YAML definition of the deployed application container and the pod are greatly expanded from what we originally defined in that deployed default YAML file. Be aware that you can retrieve the same YAML file information using the terminal console as well if you prefer to dissect code that way. Do so by executing the following command. And from that output, let's first identify the SCC that was assigned to the container upon deployment. This information is recorded under the annotations branch, the annotations branch beginning approximately on line 5, and the line of interest for us to really inspect is on line 27 of the YAML file. The value assigned to this field is set to restricted, which denotes that the default deployment received the restricted SCC privileges. The restricted SCC represents the highest priority and the most restrictive SCC available to the service account which makes sense when you think about it. The default or baseline behavior for new deployments on the cluster should always strive to give the least number of privileges to a container or a pod in adherence to the principles of zero trust and least privilege. Scrolling further down the YAML definition, you'll find additional details on the service account being used, the pod's SC values, and the container's SC values. On line 152, locate the service account name field, with the value default assigned, which carries the implications that were just mentioned. In a few moments, we will try adjusting this value to a non-default setting and measure the impact it has on the SCC and the SC values. On line 161, nested details on the security context for the pod are located. The security context was assigned SE Linux options and an FS group setting as determined by the project defaults that were mentioned on line 152. On line 173, the security context for the container is detailed, and that contrasts with the security context of the pod 
161. On 173, we can see that the container security context was set and assigned some specific capabilities like drop and run as user, which are also derived from the project defaults. Take note that the container's run as user parameter on line 180 has the same value as the pod's FS group values on 164. Now that we've inspected the container's runtime permissions, let's test them out in practice to see what effect those permissions have. Return to the terminal window that is logged into the cluster via the OCCLI and use the following command to retrieve the name of that pod. Then submit the following command to instruct the OCCLI to remote shell into the pod's container. Check the user ID and group memberships associated with that pod's container. The following instructions will display the user ID to your screen. Next, show the user ID, UID, and the group ID, GID, and the group memberships of the pod's container. Let's take a moment now to understand what information these values give us. Recall from earlier that the container was assigned the restricted SEC. The implications of this is that the user ID and the group ID fields were assigned based on the project defaults. Had we specified any user ID or group fields in the original manifest definition, those would have taken priority over the defaults. The user ID is the one that we assigned previously within the YAML file within the security as user field. The user ID was assigned to the root group, which is ID 0 by default, and the user is also a member of the file system group, which in our case, the file system group is the same as your user ID, having been assigned in the pod field security context.fs group. Let's examine the permissions assigned to various directories on the file system group, specifically the root directory, the temp directory, and the mounted volume, using the following instruction set. The values returned to screen give us a number of data points to parse and to understand. First, take note that the volume was mounted at var opt app data, which matches what we specified in the deployed default YAML manifest file. Second, the volume directory's group ID was assigned FS group ID. Furthermore, set group ID mode has also been set, which will force all new files created in this directory to be owned by the parent FS group ID. By contrast, the root and temp directories do not use FS group ID. The temp directory is writable for all users and the root directory is writable only for the root user. Let's go a step further and try writing the file to each of those locations that we created earlier. Based on the permissions described above, we should expect that most, but not all, of those instructions will be successfully executed based on the directories being written to and the type of user who's performing those actions. Try to write a file on the volume using the following instruction set. Then write a file to the temp directory. Then write a new file in the root directory. Check the permissions across all the files that we just attempted to create. Let's now dig into that output. The file written to the volume is owned by your user ID and the file system group ID, which is owing to the set group ID parental field that was mentioned earlier. The default behavior in this case is for the file system group ID to inherit parentally from the set group ID field. This is significant because in the next steps of the hands-on lab, we'll be actively choosing the group that we want to share the files with instead of inheriting them from the parent as we did in this case. The file written in the temp directory is owned by your user ID and the default group ID, which is root. This local file behavior highlights the effect of the file system group on your mounted volume. The third file failed to write to the root directory because we do not have write permissions under the current user to write files to the root directory. We need to be running as root or an otherwise privileged user in order to perform that type of action. Not an entirely surprising result when you think about it, but a useful validation for us that actions are being withheld based on the user ID and file system group ID permissions. So it's a good validation that as a non-root user, I am unable and you are unable to write to a root-based directory. In the following section, we'll take a pause on issuing more commands to the cluster and drill a little bit more deeply into the SCC concepts and terminology so they have a richer understanding in terms of how these items interact with the overall system.